not good that man be alone. That's right in the Bible too. <laughs> and all this isolation. Don't let it get to you. Don't let it get to you. Stay connected to the lifeline. Amen. That's what God offers us. He offers us a lifeline. Everything we're talking about is resurrection power. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. So um, we're just missing you all. And can't wait to get back together again. I posted a picture of the status of our chapel. Uh, we're renovating a chapel over at the Fellowship Deaconry. And if you haven't seen it, you want to go to our Facebook page. And I took the picture from the balcony upstairs, and it really shows you the beauty of the arches and the white paint and just uh, fresh life coming into a beautiful building built in 1939 <laughs> and uh, just needed a fresh breath of God that's coming in and not thrilled to tell you that they told us we have to halt our construction because um, you know we want to see this thing continue so please pray for that okay I don't want to be selfish about it but there are other uh, construction jobs that are allowed to go on because they're considered essential and it just seems really ironic to me that if I was building a liquor store I could continue <laughs> but if I'm building a chapel of a church I have to stop like I, I don't think a liquor store is any more essential than the church is amen so um, let's just pray about that not complain about it but just pray about it also we really should pray for our president I mean we always should but especially right now he he was very honest in one of his last press conferences and said he's facing the biggest decision of his life and you can feel the weight on him in his office because he's got two choices effectively he can continue the lockdown or he can somehow modify the lockdown and start business again and both of those offer dire consequences if it doesn't go well right so if we don't get back to work soon the economy could completely go into a shutdown and if we do go back to work soon, we could be spreading the virus more. And he just needs the wisdom of God, amen? I believe he's calling out to God because he realizes that's a big, weighty decision. And Lord, we just pray for President Trump right now, wherever he is. We lift him, his cabinet members, the rest of his people around him, the governors of all the states that are also facing warlike decisions that they have to make when there's literally lives on the line. And Lord, it's got to be you providing the answer. It's got to be godly wisdom. And we ask you to download fresh strategies from heaven. You were not caught by surprise with this thing. You have a strategy to defeat it. And we ask you to fill these leaders with your godly wisdom in Jesus' name. Um, I'm sure a lot of you probably also know healthcare workers that are showing up for work every day in the hospitals. And that is a warlike situation. In some cases, triage the way that they have to do on the battlefield where there's a limited amount of medical resources and more people that need help than they can provide. And we really want to pray for those folks too. Just the courage that they're displaying. So Lord, we lift up the medical workers, the doctors, the nurses, the staffs at the hospitals that are going to work every day and potentially being exposed to this virus. We pray a strong dose of courage to fill them. And we recognize the amazing commitment that they have and the fearlessness that they have to continue to go to work every day. We ask a divine hedge of protection to be around all of them as they go about their business, saving people's lives. And Lord, we ask you to lift this plague, lift this plague off our nation and every other nation in the world. We curse COVID-19 at its root. It's a counterfeit crown, and we have the true crown of Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, over our lives. In Jesus' name. So, you know, the Passover and the Easter, for some reason over the years, uh, a terrible reason, it got disconnected. Our Christian faith should never have been disconnected from our Jewish roots. And unfortunately, a lot of people, when they hear about resurrection, they think of, like I said earlier, Easter, chocolate eggs, uh, egg, egg hunts, whatever that's called. I don't even know. But like that is so far away from what the true meaning of what we're supposed to be celebrating today is. Not meaning to be critical, but don't get distracted and think it's about Easter bunnies, okay? It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that ever happened in the history of the world was that he came out of that tomb. And Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, he says, you know, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. And you don't want that to be the case. You don't want our faith to be in vain. We can believe because he's still alive. And when he gave us his spirit, he gave us a living spirit. 
called Holy Spirit that's inside of us. Okay, so think about Passover. The, the Jewish people first got freedom in Egypt. They were brought there through deliverance, but then they became a threat to the ruling powers. That's still going on today, right? The ruling powers never like it when another force comes with an opposite spirit than they have. And that's happening and the contending that's going on in our world today, it's still evident that that's there. So they came out of Egypt and God gave them wealth to come out of Egypt because the Egyptians brought all their gold and jewelry and gave it to them on their way out. So we're believing for that, okay? And as I mentioned that, I want to just lift up the offering envelope because this is also first fruits, right? We give our tithes and our offerings, but then at the beginning of a month, the first fruit idea is just like if you open a business and you get that first sale, you tape it, right? You tape the $5 bill or whatever it was up on the wall saying that was a, a sign of life for my business. And as we go into each month, we give a first fruits offering to say, Lord, I'm sowing in to this next month because I know you have good things in store for me. You have a plan for my life. The thief would try to come and steal, kill, and destroy, but you have come that I might have life and have it more abundantly. So as we lift up our offering envelopes, we say, Lord, this first fruit is, is the benefit of serving you. There's many people that don't have jobs, but there's also many people who are still working, who are in those industries that not only are allowed to operate, but are keeping the economy alive right now. The people who work in the food stores and so many other industries that are just essential to us. We think the church is essential. So maybe we'll just start a petition and, and get people to sign it and say, if a liquor store is essential, the church is essential. How about that? If an abortion clinic is essential industry, then church is an essential industry, okay? If that's cool, we should be cool too, I think, because we're doing a whole lot of good as, as the body of Christ. All the phone calls, all the meals that get delivered, all the ways that we can pray with people over the phone and the Zoom calls to keep encouraging people in the difficult situations that they're in. So um, I just want to give you an update too before I pray over the offering because, like I said, I posted that picture. Uh, the chapel looks beautiful, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And with the construction stopping, that's just one more obstacle that the enemy is trying to put in our path and we want to pray against that okay for king of kings family especially pray that that construction ban for the church gets lifted that we can get an exception if necessary because once they allow us to start meeting again we want to be able to meet there and if the construction stops then we can foresee where they could say we're allowed to meet but our place isn't ready yet and we say no to that plan of the enemy okay say no to that plan of the enemy the construction will continue and and that place is going to give glory to god amen all right so do me a favor if you have an offering and you want to mail it into the church it's still 219 mount airy road baskin ridge new jersey 07920 We've been getting most of the offerings coming still in the mail, which is awesome. Thank you. People are giving online. There's a lot of ways that you can give online. You can go right to our website. There's a donate button. You can go to our Facebook page. There's a donate button right there. So it's not hard to give. I understand if people lost their jobs or saying, I don't know if I can't afford to give, we would say be careful and don't, don't get bound up by fear and don't stop giving to the Lord. That's where our blessing comes from. Amen. It's not tit for tat with the Lord. He wants to look at your heart. And when we recognize that our help comes from above, our help comes from the Lord, we don't want to cut off that supply line of heaven of blessing over our lives. Amen. He said, test me and prove me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that's too great for you to even contain. I like that one. Somebody should say amen. I got a few people here that can say amen. All right. So Lord, we thank you for your provision over our lives. We thank you for this covenant relationship that you have us in, that you never leave us or forsake us like we say, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you're a loving God and we can trust you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we live our lives for you. You gave your life for us and we give our life back to you, including in the way we give. And we sow this seed into the kingdom of God to see it expand, to make you famous in this region. Not unto us, Lord, but unto your name be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're here and you want to just uh, put it up in the offering basket, that's okay too. All right, where two or more are gathered in his name, he is here. And we know he's here. 
we can sense his presence with us. I'm going to jump into scripture in a minute. If you, again, if you go on our Facebook page, we usually put up the theme of what we're going to be talking about. And uh, it was quoted already today. Death is swallowed up in victory is, is the main thing I'm going to focus on. But I just thought before I did that, um, just some general wisdom, things that we've learned over the years and, and, and the kind of uh, dilemma that we're presented with right now in this isolation stage that we're in. And, and it, it can be really very difficult emotionally. Do me a favor, just turn that fan off for me. Um, the, uh, the enemy loves isolation. He was booted out of heaven and, and landed here in the earth, and, and we, we would call that an orphan spirit, right? It's not that we're trying to be critical of, of people who've lost their parents, right? Uh, if, if people are orphans, that in itself is not a terrible thing from God. It's a horrible situation to be in. But when we talk in a spiritual realm, that isolation and the orphan spirit thinks that it can't connect to anything because it's worried about being hurt. And God is saying, no, I'm a father. I'm a good father. You can call me daddy, actually. You could say Abba Father. You can call out to him. And there's a spirit of adoption that comes over us. So when we're isolated like this, it's like a form of punishment, especially for people who live alone. Because we are wired by God. We were made to live in community with each other and to connect with each other. So it's just an abominable plan from the pit that we can't be together and can't talk to each other. But you can offset it by knowing what the strategy of the enemy is and then having a counteroffensive against that strategy, okay? So the first thing I want to say is there's a war for your altar. <laughs> if you can go back into our videos that we've been showing and our messages, that was actually the title of messages that we've done here in this in this new year of 2020 because that's what the Lord has showed us about rebuilding our personal altar and and this is where shame could start to creep in because it's been a couple of weeks now that we've been into this isolation mode and you might be beating yourself up a little bit for being uh, for, for lacking a little energy because after a while it starts to wear on you and maybe you're eating more than you normally would and you're lacking the exercise you can't go to the gym the weather hasn't been great and and now you're you're looking at yourself and you're saying negative things over yourself don't do that that's a strategy of the enemy look in the mirror and said I am a child of God I know who I am I walk in power I work in miracles I live a life of favor and one of the fruit there's, there's fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. One of them listed is self-control. It's also called temperance in the King James Version. That says that when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you have the ability to not let your flesh rule over your spirit. That's part of the spiritual warfare, is the enemy wants to get you in a downward spiral, feeling bad about yourself because you might have lacked discipline in a certain area. We come against that lie right now in Jesus' name, and we say you're going to know your true identity, who you are, stay in the Word, keep worshiping. The Internet is an amazing tool. Can you imagine? If this happened 20 years ago, we wouldn't have had the bandwidth to have all of this ability to download good things. Obviously, there's a negative side to that because there's a lot of bad things that can be downloaded too. But people wouldn't even be able to work online. The schools wouldn't have been able to continue online the way they've been. So there's plenty of upside, and you don't have to focus on the downside. You want to be an optimistic person. That's another fruit of, of the Spirit of God is that he gives us an eternal perspective. We recognize, though... There are light and momentary afflictions that we go through in this day, but they don't compare to the glory that will be revealed in us and through us at his return. And, and that's what you have to keep doing. Trisha told me in the beginning when she first got saved, she would stand in the mirror in the bathroom and point at herself and speak the promises of God over herself. In, in those areas where the enemy was trying to attack her with low self-esteem and just a, a low a worthless feeling or depression. No, you speak it to the mirror. All God's promises are yes and amen. Speak them out. Use your mouth. It's amazing. All right, so what's a positive that could come out of this is that you do in, in uh, the 12-step programs, they talk about doing a personal audit. And if I remember correctly, it's a fearless personal audit because when you're in isolation like this, things, roots will get exposed. Right? The, the things that you really treasure are what you spend your time on. That's another verse in the Bible that we'll cover. But if you look back over the last couple of weeks of isolation and you do an audit of how you've spent your time, 
you could say that you value something, but if you're not spending your time on it, then you really don't value it. And if you're spending a lot of time on video games, just as an example, uh, you know, that might sound like an odd example, but I'm just continually shocked by how much of an addiction it is for people. That's really not redemptive. It might be entertainment. There's nothing wrong with entertainment, but if there's hours and hours of it, that might be an escape. I get it, but there's nothing coming back at you. There's no nutrition coming back at you. It's like chewing gum where it tastes good, but there's no nutrition. If all you had on a desert island was chewing gum, you would die, right? You need food. And this is the best seller of all time for a reason, okay? It's food. Read it. Study it. Use YouTube to find anointed preaching and, and study the preaching. You can put it on pause. You can look up the verses. If you want to, you can find really productive ways to spend your time. You can also get outside and walk now that the weather's getting nicer. Don't allow the enemy to put you in that docile state because depression sets in in those places too. We say no to that. That's a lie of the enemy. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm going to live for the Lord. Amen. And then I put Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And it's hard to see sometimes when you're in it that how could this ever work out for good? Well, on a personal level, what I just said could be one of those things. A root could have gotten exposed, and you might, as you're doing that audit, say, I don't need to do that anymore, video games or whatever the, the particular thing is that you've been bound up in. And, you, you know, it's very addictive to, to be online. So use the redemptive part of it. Use the word of God part, the worship part of it, and not all the other distractions that the enemy would try to put in your way. And I love this verse. We teach it a lot when we do our Possessing Your Vessel class. It's in Luke chapter 6, verse 48. It says, a person building a house digs down deep and lays a foundation. All right, and when you do that, when you dig down deep, you're digging into your own heart and you're reflecting on how I've spent the last couple of weeks and, and if the equation is coming out where there's a lot of unredemptive things or actually destructive things because apparently liquor store sales are booming right now. And we call that medicating your pain. Okay, you might be binge watching shows on Netflix for 15 hours, I don't know. That's another form of medicating your pain and escaping. Don't do that. Use the time in a redemptive way. Write down what you're going through. Put a journal together. Use the word of God. What is he speaking to you? Be proactive. Don't just sit there and take it. No, we're not spectators as Christians. We're engaged. The Bible says we take it by force. So we lay a deep foundation. You dig all the way down to the rock, and then when the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. And I just speak that prophetically over you as well, that you are digging down deep. The Lord could use this time to reveal roots that we need to work on, and you can be proactive about going after it and saying, nope, I'm not living less than the full life that he wants for me to have. And what I alluded to is Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, okay? So again, we could talk a good game. We could say that we really value reading the word, but we have a lot of free time on our hands now. So how much time have we been reading the word? I value worship. I really make it a high priority in my life, but how much time have I spent worshiping? And that's not a condemning word. It's just to say, wow, I could make some changes in the way where I'm putting my priorities. And you'll find... There's a whole lot of victory in that. All right, so I'm going to get to 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and 55. And that's where Paul is writing, and he says, death is swallowed up in victory. So, Lord, I just pray that all of us would get a fresh insight on the truth of this word, that death has been defeated and has been swallowed up in victory. And it's just like we, Patricia and I were watching the movie um, about Moses and going before Pharaoh. What was the name of it? The Ten Commandments, I'm sorry, I should have known that. Yule Brenner and Charlton Heston, it goes way back. And they didn't have a whole lot of uh, special effects back then. But there is a scene when Moses is standing before Pharaoh and his rod turns into a serpent and the magicians do that. But then the, Moses' staff, that's a serpent, turns and eats those. He swallows them up. And that's the picture I get. Death has been swallowed up. And then it turns back into the staff again. Again. You know, that, I don't know how long ago. It was a long time ago. The special effects may be a little lacking by today's standards. But the point is, God wins. 
God wins. I'm going to quote it again and again. We are going through light and momentary afflictions today compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And it might not seem like a light affliction right now. You might be grieving the loss of a loved one or friends of yours that have lost people. I'm not making light of that. I'm just saying by comparison to what the resurrection offers us, we should still be celebrating the resurrection life that dwells in us as Christians. So I'll unpack it a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15. I hope you have your Bible handy. If you do, I'm going to read from a translation called uh, the New King, I'm sorry, uh, Kingdom New Testament. And I love this first line because it's a new word that I've never heard before. And Paul, what Paul's doing is just comparing the difference between the life that we inherited from Adam and Eve because they sinned in the garden, that's on this side, with the new life that we have in Christ, okay? There's a lot of ways you can compare it. This could be looked at as our flesh, and this is our spirit. Um, this could be the bondage being under the law, and this is the freedom that we have in Christ now that we've been freed from that curse, okay? Not that the Old Testament is wrong, but we've been freed from works mentality, and it's by grace we are saved through faith, right? So he's talking about the difference between the body that we inherited from Adam and Eve, which is decaying, okay? And again, I know we probably have some guests, so we talk about this a lot here, but if you haven't heard it, Death came into the garden when the serpent beguiled Adam and Eve and, and convinced them to eat from the tree, right? That was the forbidden fruit, and they ate it. And, and the lie that he gave is, you're not going to die when you eat that fruit. And when she picked it and ate it, she didn't die. So she assumed that Satan was correct. And then Adam came, and he ate it too. And they didn't die when they ate it, but they brought death in, okay? That's been the curse on mankind ever since. Things decay. That wasn't God's plan. It's not his plan still. When he comes back, things are not going to decay anymore. There's no more death on that side. So we're living in this middle place from where they had this perfect garden, no sin, no death, no decay. They sin. We live in a world now. And then Jesus comes, not just lives a sinless, perfect life and dies on the cross, as great as that is, the real power comes when he comes out of the grave because now he's proven that death has been defeated. Don't forget that. We have a taste of that resurrection life right now because he gives us his Holy Spirit. And that's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's, it's right in the word. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you and me today. That's worth celebrating over. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, it says, This decaying body must put on an undecaying body. So just to help you understand what he's saying, when you die and you go to heaven, you're you have this picture of living in some ethereal atmosphere on a cloud playing a harp. And that's not the full promise of God. Okay? There's going to be a second coming, and we're going to rule and reign with him, and we will have resurrected bodies. Say amen. Go ahead. I can hear you saying it. The resurrected body is going to be way better than this one that we're living in right now. No decay. Ho! Oh, I like that idea. Every year you start liking it a little bit more right? There's no gravity pulling your muscles down. <laughs> so we're going to have a new body, a resurrected body, a version 2.0. So the cloud and the harp and all is really much less of a picture than we should be thinking. We're going to rule and reign with him forever with resurrected bodies. And that's, that's the hope of the resurrection. It wasn't just Jesus. We will be. So this new word that he has all right, so he said the decaying body must put on the undecaying one, and the dying body must put on deathlessness. <laughs> deathlessness. What a great word. I never heard it before. Deathless. So you can picture being breathless. <laughs> How about being deathless? That's resurrection life. Deathlessness. That's what we're going to have. We're so used to death and dying and decay, we can have even a hard time imagining what it might be like to live in a world where there is no death. And, and that's basically what I alluded to before when Jesus came and saw Mary and Martha grieving over the loss of their brother. It's like, no, he's going to live again. We're going to all live again. We're going to all have a resurrected life. And without belaboring the point, everything we're doing now is going to count towards that future life that we have. I can prove that in Scripture. All right, so it's not a works mentality. It's just the way, the, the rules of engagement that we're involved in. The Lord looks at our heart, and he wants to know that we recognize that we're on a mission. 
He said it, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Not just to wait to die, to live on a cloud. No, you have a mission in your life, and we want to activate you in that mission. So then in verse 54, he says, when the decaying puts on the undecaying, and the dying puts on the undying, then that saying that has been written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That's what you have. That's what I have. That's the hope that we have of people that do go home to be with the Lord. We're going to see them again because their spirit didn't die. And they're coming back with Jesus, and we're going to all have resurrected bodies. So there's this period in the middle, and then we come back with him at his final return. And then Paul has these famous verses where it says, Death, where has your victory gone? Death, where has your sting gone? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thank God he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. A couple verses from Exodus, right? I just want to continue to... Remind you of the theme that we're going through the Passover season. And if you follow our YouTube channel, if you know the kind of videos we've been posting, a lot of Chuck Pierce's words over the last couple of years have been pointing towards this season that we're in right now. He's been warning of a difficult time to come, and he said it was going to go through Passover. I mean, watch the, the videos that we have on our channel, and you'll see incredibly how over really two years, the first one goes back two years and four months when he said, Write it down. Two years and four months from now, we're going to be in a swamp, he called it at the time. But then there's five or six, maybe even more, other clips of times that he spoke about this. But he said through Passover, which in indicates to me that as we go through, this thing's going to die off. Okay? And that's what I'm, that's what I'm believing for. I'm, I'm believing that, you know, you, you succeed when you believe the prophets, when you know they're, that they're real, accurate prophets. So in Exodus it says, that the Jews grew in power in Egypt, and a new pharaoh came into place that didn't know ab about Jacob and Joseph and, and, uh, and the history of them. And you know what happens. People get threatened. It says the Israelites had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly. Sorry, this is Exodus 1, verse 7. They multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. And eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. <laughs> if that's not demonic, and we're not trying to be critical if you have an Egyptian descent, it's just representing how sin operates, okay? It feels threatened. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees felt threatened by him. So instead of getting under, uh, underneath his teaching and his covering and joining him, they felt like they had to kill him because he was threatening their power base. And no power base likes to be threatened. No secular power base. Jesus is a servant king. Whole different operation. <laughs> so here's what Pharaoh says. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So they had them as slaves, and they didn't want to let the slaves go. And we sang today, we're no longer slaves to fear. We get freed from the slavery of fear. Verse 11, Exodus 1. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy, down to verse 13. And you know the story. I'm sure you've seen that movie, The Ten Commandments, that I mentioned. There were all different plagues that the Lord sent to, to try to soften Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh is a representation of that stubborn rebellion that, that, that Satan represents. He rebelled against God in heaven and was kicked out. And Pharaoh said, no, nope, I'm not letting the people go. I'm not letting the people go. Plague after plague came. Finally, they go. And they worship, and Pharaoh's army is swallowed up. That's another day's teaching from today. Because I want to talk about what we have today in this new dispensation that we're in. On this side of the resurrection, when Jesus came out of that tomb, everything changed on our planet. The availability of that same resurrection life became available to anybody who wants it. No qualifications necessary. I'm sure glad about that, because if I needed to qualify, I would not have made the cut. 
So Romans 6, this is Paul writing again. He says, Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. All right? Dies no more. He was resurrected. He lived a perfect life. He broke the power of sin, and then he broke the power of death. Having been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer, no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Again, back to our Old Testament roots as Christians, the priests in the temple would have to bring offerings for the people. And he'd have to do it every year. He'd have to seek atonement for the people every year. So there was a constant flow of sacrifices being made. What we're told here in Romans 6.10 is it happened once for everybody, for eternity. Okay, that's how powerful the breaking off of death was, that it only had to be done once for us because he was the perfect Passover lamb. And you might remember that too in the New Testament. John said, be, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what he was talking about. Jesus was going to be the sacrificial lamb to hang on that cross and take our sins, take the punishment for our sins on his back and then come out of the tomb and say, now resurrection, eternal life is available to everybody, everyone who wants it. You can be a son and daughter of a living God if you invite him into your life. Then verse 11 of Romans 6 says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a little bit of a, a more complex thought there, right? If we're Christians, can we still sin? Please say yes, okay? But what's the difference between what we do now compared to before we knew the Lord is that the nature of sin has been defeated in us. doesn't mean we don't ever do it, but we don't want to do it. Because the greatest commandment, Jesus said this, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It doesn't mean you'll be perfect and you'll never make a mistake, but it means that you're on a course of obedience to serving him. You're a man and a woman after God's own heart, just like David, men and women after God's own heart. And you can look in the New Testament and see somebody like Peter, who before the resurrection was denying Christ. After the day of Pentecost, when he gets filled with the Spirit, he becomes a, a powerful leader in the body of Christ in the early church. Instead of being ashamed by past mistakes, God fills him and says, no, you're now going to lead in the kingdom of God. Your nature is going to change. Sorry, I'm spitting. It's a good sign, I guess. I'm excited. <laughs> so our natures have changed. We're not perfect. We still make mistakes, but they're not intentional, okay? There are mistakes because we're maturing and we're trying to learn how to apply this word. There's answers in here for every question that we have, but they're not always evident. We have to dig for them and find them, okay? So we make mistakes, but there's forgiveness for our mistakes, and that's another day's teaching as well. But just recognize, even though we're not perfect, we're serving God and we're on a mission to continue to be obedient and follow him because there's blessings in obedience. All right, so I want to talk about a lady named Mary. And she came from a, a city called Magdala. So she's Mary Magdalene in the Bible. And she's really a heroic figure in a lot of ways. She probably doesn't get as much uh, popularity as she should. But she was a woman after God's own heart. After having a very difficult past prior to knowing Jesus, she made a lot of mistakes. How many qualify in that category? I'll wait till all the hands, four hands go up here. Marissa, raise your hand. Okay, she just did. All right, I'll do it. All right, we have, we have backgrounds that we're not necessarily proud of, right? The enemy can use our past against us and bring charges against us. And say, yeah, but you did this. Yeah, but you did that. And... You have to say, that's true, but I've been forgiven. The punishment for those sins was taken to the cross, and now, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far my transgressions have been removed from me. That's out of the Psalms. All right, so this is where we find Jesus um, mentioning Mary. It's Luke chapter 8, verse 1. It says, he took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. We might use the word delivered from evil spirits. That's still in operation today. There's still people that need deliverance from evil spirits. That hasn't gone away. God has power to deliver people from evil spirits. Um, and I, I've said this to our church before, but, you know, when the liquor store says spirits unlimited right on the front of the building, that should give you a little bit of a warning <laughs> Okay? Why are they called spirits? All right, just think about it. It might not be the best thing for you. 
to have unlimited spirits in your life. You want the Holy Spirit. You want the Spirit of God in you. Doesn't mean you can't have a glass of wine, but don't be drunk, okay? That's clear in the Bible. That's a sin. If you're drunk, you're off on all wrong tangents, all right? So he took his 12 disciples with him, Luke 8, 1 and 2, took them with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. So I'm, I'm holding Mary up as an example of all of us that had backgrounds that we're not proud of, that the devil could accuse us of all the mistakes we made. But here's the deal. Even if you grew up as a Christian and you didn't have that rogue path that a lot of us had, you have a different set of issues that you could be dealing with. You could be dealing with pride and self-righteousness, okay? You might not have ever been out doing drugs and, 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 and living a, a wild lifestyle, but there's other issues that you still have to deal with because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So none of us can look at the other and say, I'm better than you. We all have to acknowledge that we have sinned. So we are all Mary in one way here is, is my point I'm trying to make. And it says very specifically, he cast out seven demons out of Mary. And seven is a sign of completion. So it's throughout the Bible, it's like a whole cycle of stuff that was in her got cleansed out of her by the power that Jesus operated in from heaven. We have that power operating in us today. You can clean out the critters in your own life. Okay, that's what those spirits are like. And that's another day's teaching as well. But we have a friend who was in the pest control business, and the company was called Critter Gitter. It was down south. And now he's in the deliverance ministry, so we joke and say, you're still getting critters. You're just getting a different kind of critters out of there. And it's serious to need deliverance, but it's not something to be in any shame over. Tap into the power of God and get cleansed. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all iniquity. Mm. All right, so Galatians 2.20, over the Mary grid, he says, my old identity. So if you're Mary, she was a prostitute prior. My old identity as a prostitute, in her case, has been co-crucified with the Messiah. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You get a new identity. When you come into Christ, you're born again. You have a, a second life. You're tapped into the Spirit. You have a new identity as a child of God that we sang about today. She got a new identity and recognized it and was very grateful about the forgiveness that she received. My old identity, it says in Galatians 2.20, the Passion Translation, has been co-crucified with the Messiah and no longer lives. That old identity no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him, the old me. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me, and we live in union as one. What a promise. All right? We've been co-crucified with Christ. That old man is gone, and we have a new identity in Christ. It says, my new life is empowered by the faithfulness of the Son of God. So when we say all God's promises are yes and amen, it's because Jesus came and was obedient to the Father's will, went to the cross, really died. He was a person, and he really died. He went to that cross with the faith to believe that God would raise him from the dead. It wasn't some different state, and God did raise him from the dead. And because he was faithful, we receive the blessing of his faithfulness. He loves me so much that he gave himself for me, and he dispenses his life into me. Philippians 3.20 says, our citizenship is in heaven. All right, another great principle in the word, if this is new to you. When we were born into sin, we were born as citizens of this earth, and, and the wages of sin is death, so we were bound for the grave with no hope. But now we have a new citizenship. You're not just born again. You become an ambassador of a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And you have a new passport, a new citizenship. You don't have to wait for a green card. <laughs> you get it the instant you say yes to the Lord. And Paul says in Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is, all right, verse 21, Philippians 3. Who will transform our lowly bodies? Think about that. That's what I said earlier. You're going to get a version 2.0 of your body. 
It's not on a cloud somewhere. You're going to physically be alive and ruling and reigning with Jesus at his return. He's going to transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. According to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. That's my picture for you. Just think about Mary and the shame she carried in her old character and her first identity. She's now saying, even of, of all the defilement that I did to myself through being a prostitute, I'm getting a new body. God restores our innocence. Whatever the sin was that was defiling our lives, he restores it and gives us a new hope and a new identity right now in this life. And in the age to come, it says. And then 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes back and says that the body that we inherited from Adam and Eve was sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in honor. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 43. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. Verse 49. And just as we have borne the likeness of Adam and Eve, the earthly man, so also shall we bear the likeness of the heavenly man, and that's Jesus. That should make you happy. All right, I'm coming down the home stretch. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus the Messiah once for all. That act that he did of dying on the cross that we celebrated on Good Friday sanctified us if we want to receive it. We become holy by becoming children of God. His act, this says in Hebrews 10.10, 10, sanctified us through his offering once for everyone. Thus it came about that every priest, this is the Old Testament now, would stand daily at his duty offering over and over the same sacrifices that can never take away the sins. It doesn't re remove that sin nature that we were born with. It just buys us another day of forgiveness. But we have to keep making those sacrifices. Verse 12 says, but Jesus offered a single sacrifice on behalf of sins for all time, and then he sat down at the right hand of God. By a single sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are sanctified. I hope this has given you hope today. This, this holiday of Passover celebration, resurrection, is all about the hope that we have when we become children of God. I'm going to go to John chapter 20. How you all doing? The four that are here with their coats on. <laughs> all right, good. So we're going to go to John chapter 20 and try to look at the merging of the Old and the New Testament just in this one chapter with this woman that I've been pointing you to called Mary Magdalene. And uh, A lot of the emails and uh, texts that have been going back and forth among our Christian community is different songs and different videos. And there's a show called The Chosen that everybody is raving about that you can only get online but it's Christian-based, and I haven't seen it yet just because I've been busy, but people really like it. But there's also one now from a place called Sight and Sound that is showing the play of Jesus that we saw in person a year and a half, I guess it was, ago, and it was really powerful. So you can get that for free right now if you just hunt it down and find it. That's a redemptive way to spend your free time that you have, right? If you can't leave the house, feed your spirit with good food. And I remember this scene from Sight and Sound um, when, when Mary recognizes that she's been set free from all of this. And it really sticks with you. So anyway, in, in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Very early Sunday morning. I'm reading again from the Passion Translation. Some translations say, on the first day of the week. All right? And you might wonder, why do Christians gather on Sunday mornings, this is one of the main reasons that that pattern developed is because it's the first day of the week when Jesus rose out of the tomb. So that's what we do. We give the first fruits of our time and say, okay, Lord, I have a week coming up. Sunday has been carved out as a day of worship, or at least it used to be. Now it's a day of soccer and football and all these other things. That was never supposed to be how, how it went. We were supposed to carve out a day and recognize the Lord. And in the first hours of the first day of the week, I'm going to get my body out of bed and come and join together because I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There's some power of being connected into a corporate community of other believers where we can encourage one another. And the, the psalmist said, come magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. There's power in that magnification. So first day of the week, very early on a Sunday morning, 
It reminds us of Genesis chapter 1, the first day God speaks and creates. Now it's the first day in the new dispensation. She comes, Mary Magdalene made her way to the tomb. Why? Is because back in those days, they'd not bury people right away. They kept them in a tomb until they decomposed, and then they would take their bones and put the bones in a bone box. I know it sounds odd, but it's a very different time. It's 2,000 years ago. So the people that would love the person who died would bring oil and fragrances, <coughs> excuse me, in order for there not to be much of a smell. And you might remember when Martha said to Jesus about Lazarus, oh, he's been in there for four days. By now, there's going to be a smell. And then when Jesus said, come forth, Lazarus, he walked out. No smell. Mm, resurrected. That's awesome. He died again, unfortunately, Lazarus, one of the few people who died twice. <laughs> but Jesus never died again, only once for him. All right, so it says... When she arrived, she discovered that the stone that sealed the entrance of the tomb was moved away. So she was running as fast as she could to go tell Peter and the other disciples. Initially, she thinks this, they've taken the Lord's body from the tomb and we don't know where he is. Why is it Mary that's the first one there that morning? Because she's loving the Lord her God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. She's the first one there. And this is the option that all of us have. Nobody can regulate your intensity level of how much you love the Lord but you. And she beat the other apostles that had been there with him. She was the first one there to show honor to God. Right? And that's what God looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And she had the heart, partly because she had been forgiven for so much. But we've all been forgiven for so much, regardless of our lifestyle. Yes, please. I have somebody waving at me in the front row here. And, and Did you get the other mic? one of the things that I just want to bring out at this point is Jesus honored women. And in a society where women are, have been so abused and taken advantage of, Jesus Christ always honored women. And so Mary Magdalene being the first one, in those days even, women weren't really honored. But I'm going to say this, wherever Jesus Christ is Lord, women are honored. So I just wanted to make that point. And I honor you, darling. Yes, you do, honey. Glad she's on our side. <laughs> All right, so she goes back, and it says in verse 3, John chapter 20, verse 3, Peter and the other disciple, he's talking about himself, okay? John is saying the other disciple about himself. They jumped up and ran to the tomb to go see for themselves. They started out together, but the other disciple outran Peter. This is John giving himself a little kudo here. I outran him, and he reached the tomb first, John did, and he didn't enter the tomb, but he peeked in, and he saw only the linen cloths lying there. Then Peter came behind him and went right into the tomb, and he too noticed the linen cloths lying there. But the burial cloth that had been on Jesus' head had been rolled up and placed separate from the other cloth, so it was clear that somebody took the time to be careful to roll up this burial cloth. A thief wouldn't have done that. A thief wouldn't have, that, that was taking his body would not have rolled up the cloth. All right, so it says in verse 8, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, again, talking about himself, and after one looked, he believed. All right, so again, I'll read it again, verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in, and after one look, he believed. Verse 9, this is the Passion Translation. For until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures that prophesied that he was destined to rise from the dead. Verse 10, puzzled, Peter and John then left and went back to their homes. Mary comes back to the tomb. Ah, so Peter and John leave. These are two pillars in the early church. Mary, like Trisha said, was a woman who, you know, at that time, it was very different than today. They didn't go to school. They couldn't vote. They were almost treated like slaves themselves and as property. So here she is, though, relentlessly seeking after God. She doesn't, she's not satisfied with staying away like Peter and John were. They were going back to talk to the other disciples. Mary wanted to stay there. Just like Joshua in the Old Testament, he would go into the tabernacle with Moses and they would be praying, and he didn't want to leave. And there's that passion again. He stayed 
in the presence of God. We need to do the same. All right. So it says in verse 11, she arrived back at the tomb broken and sobbing, and she stooped to peer inside, and through her tears, she saw two angels. Peter and John didn't see the two angels, did they? Because they didn't wait. But when we wait on the Lord, he shows up. He's looking at our heart. How badly do you want this? In that regard, sometimes prosperity can cause us to get soft and lose that edge and lose that, that passion to want to follow Jesus. But again, I want to just take you back to the tabernacle and the way God instructed Moses to build it. There was a place called the mercy seat, okay, where the presence of God would sit on the Ark of the Covenant in between the two angels' wings that were covering the the mercy seat, there would be a fire that would have to stay lit forever, that mercy seat. And look at the similarity here. She arrives back to verse 11 of John chapter 20, broken and sobbing. She stoops to peer inside and sees two angels in dazzling white robes sitting where Jesus' body had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. What does that remind you of? The tabernacle. There were two angels over the Ark of the Covenant. And the body now is gone. Jesus' body is gone. But they're saying, this used to be a tomb, but now it's a holy place. Mary, your life used to be a tomb. You were destined for hell if you didn't change the way you were living. Now, your life is a holy place because you're the first one who's seeing us. The other apostles left. She was relentless. Yeah, I'm telling you, she's heroic. Dear woman, verse 13 of John 20 says, why are you crying? They asked. Mary answered, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Then she turned around to leave, and there was Jesus standing in front of her, but she didn't realize it was him. That's the glorified body that we're talking about. If you're a Bible scholar and you read the, the New Testament, you know this happens again with the two people on the road to Emmaus. He appears to them and they don't recognize them until they break bread and have what we would call communion. Their eyes were opened. Just like Adam and Eve, their eyes were opened for the wrong reason in the garden, that they were naked and they had to go run ashamed. Now all of a sudden in the New Testament, when he appears to us, our eyes are open to who he is as the eternal God. So she doesn't recognize him. And he says, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Mary answered, thinking he was only the gardener. I can't skip over this. Remember who? Adam and Eve were in the garden. And now all of a sudden, Jesus comes out of the tomb, and she thinks he's the gardener. Well, you could have said at the first Adam was supposed to tend his garden, and now she thinks he's the gardener. There's so many connections back and forth between the two. <laughs> And, sir, if you have taken his, she, Mary answered, thinking he was only a gardener. Sir, if you've taken his body somewhere else, tell me, and I will go. And then all he says is, Mary. And now she recognizes his voice. He interrupted her. Turning to face him, she said, Rabboni. And that's the word Aramaic for teacher. My teacher. And can you imagine what was going on in her heart? She just lived with the freedom of the love that he gave her while he was alive. And now he's gone. So she's wondering, what's going to happen to my life? Was this real? And because of the tenacity to continue to stay there in his presence and to seek him out and honor, even honor his dead body, she's the first one to see the risen Christ. What a place of honor she has. What a place of honor any believer has. He's not bound by our resume. He doesn't look at how much education or money or success, quote, unquote, success that we've had. He looks at our heart, and we're all created equally in his eyes. I just love the fact that she was the first one to see him. And he said, don't hold on to me now, for I haven't yet ascended to God my Father. Oh, and then verse 17. And you know, I'll just touch on that again. Why did he have to ascend to God the Father? is because he was the sacrificial lamb. And there was a mercy seat in heaven. And in order for the work of the resurrection to be fully completed, for him to defeat death, he had to bring his blood 
and sprinkle it on the altar in the tabernacle in heaven with his father. That completed the cycle. No more death. You do not have to be victim to eternal separation from God, which is also called hell. You can receive the Lord. And look at how personal the language is. In John 20, this is my last verse I'm ending. Pretty good on time, I guess, right? It says, John 20, verse 17, in the Passion Translation said, He's not only my father, Mary, and not only my God, but now he's your father and your God. And she could have said, yeah, but don't you know my resume? Don't you know the mess my life was? And he's like, yep, I sure do. I'm the one who cast out seven demons out of you. You're not prohibited from entering the presence of God. In fact, Mary, you can come boldly into the presence of God through a new and living way, which is my crucified body. I provided access to you to come into the presence of the Father. We can't lose the power of this. No matter what your background is, nobody's too far away from God. There's no pit. This is what Corey Ten Boom said. There's no pit too deep that God can't stretch out his arm and reach in there and pull you out of that mess. Mary was a prostitute. She had seven demons cast out of her. She's the first one to see Jesus. He's no respecter of persons. That means that he doesn't look more favorably on one than another. He doesn't have favorites. He loves us all. Everybody here should say this out loud. I am God's favorite, and it's all true. How cool. We all said it, and it's true for every single one of us. We're all his favorite. That's not man's ways. That's God, God's ways. And before he departs from her, he wants to make sure that she knows he's not only my father and God, Mary. He's your father and your God. Now go to my brother. See all this family language. Go to my brothers who didn't even have as much faith as you had to stay here. The ones that are hiding in fear, go to them and tell them what I've told you, that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. So I just want to end this resurrection, Passover celebration with an appeal to anybody watching here who has never made that invitation to the Lord to come into your life, think about what you have to lose, okay? You can say, what do I have to lose? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bad things that you can lose by accepting Jesus Christ into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. You can lose that guilt and shame of the mistakes that we've made. You can get victory over that voice that's accusing you. That's what the Bible calls Satan, the accuser of the brethren. But when you go to the end of the book in Revelation 12, 10, it says the accuser of the brethren has been cast down when we come into relationship with Jesus Christ. And the same way he said to Mary, I'm going to my God, he's also your God and your Father. He's saying that to you. You could be adopted right now, legally adopted into the family of God by just saying yes to Jesus and recognizing it. That yes, we've sinned, but there is forgiveness for our sins. And that we don't have to live with that guilt and shame for the rest of our lives. We don't have to medicate our pain with alcohol and, and addictions and pornography and so many other ways that the devil will put a counterfeit that might work in the short run to distract you. But it's not the real thing. Jesus is the real thing. Holy Spirit's the real thing. The Bible is the real thing might not be the easiest book for you to read right off the bat, but there's plenty of people around who want to help you. Everyone here would say, before we knew the Lord, we had a hard time understanding it too. But then once we said yes to the Lord, our eyes got open and we were able to understand spiritual things differently. And that's just another rule in the kingdom is that the more you seek him, the more you're able to find him. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I will be found by those who are seeking after me. So if you ask, just stand. and just want to pray out loud. I just want to honor the presence of God that's here right now. You're getting a new passport right now. If you're saying this prayer and you're inviting the Lord in and saying, I've had enough of the old way I've been living. It's not working. i got to change what I've been doing. I need a new path to go on. 
We're going to just say this prayer out loud together. You repeat it after me. And you're going to invite Jesus to come into your heart. And then in order to know what to do next, you can just reach out to us. It's easy to find us online, website, King of Kings Worship Center. We'll send you a Bible. We'll meet with you. However we have to do it, we want to get you the, the understanding of everything that we've been talking about today in a very truncated way. There's so much good news in the Bible. So let's just say it out loud. Everybody ready? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son Jesus. I recognize I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. But Jesus came in order to save me by being crucified on that cross, taking the pain and punishment that I deserve for my sin onto his body, even though he never sinned. I heard about his love for me today, and I want to receive that love. Please impart to me the love of God that I have not experienced before my life. Make yourself real to me, Lord, because I surrender. I wave the white flag and say, I'm not going to go back into the old way of living, but I'm coming into a new way, like Mary did, of forgiveness and surrender and humility so that I can serve you and learn from you and know that you are my Father and my God. I repent of my sin and I ask you, Jesus, to fill me with your power. Fill me with your spirit. Become the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, I just pray you fill that person who said that prayer today. Fill them with your power. Would all of us that want to stand here and talk to you in person would want to say to you is, he meets you right where you're at. If you keep your eyes open, having said that prayer from a sincere heart, it's not magic. It's not superstition. He will reveal himself to you in ways that you will be shocked that he was there all along. You just couldn't see him. And again, like I said, just reach out to us and we'll be in touch with you. We're going to end it here and just say thank you so much for being with us. I pray it was like spiritual food for you to be nourished on today. And that as you go through the rest of this day, that you celebrate the resurrection in a new way that you maybe didn't understand before. And that we can rejoice with you when the day comes that you could say, yes, I said the prayer that day. And my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, I just pray for everybody who's watching today. That today would be a day of, a, of a, in-person contact with the living God that they would experience your power in a fresh new way and that you would feed them with the bread of life and the word of life and that they would recognize this awesome future that we have to live with you and rule with you forever. In Jesus' name. Everybody here said, amen. Have a great day.